Let's bring you up to speed on developments regarding the Russian invasion of Ukraine over the last few hours. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has been in Moscow late this morning. He met with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov for talks regarding the war in Ukraine. Mr Guterres says Russia has to remind people of equal sovereignty of UN member states. He says he came to Russia as a messenger of peace to save lives and reduce suffering and that frank discussions took place between him and Mr Lavrov. He also said he accepts Russia uh, has grievances, that, but the UN is there to help address such issues. Mr Guterres says the UN stands ready to fully mobilize its human and logistical resources to help save lives and evacuate people from Mariupol. Mr Lavrov, on the other hand, said Russia is interested in working with the UN and with the Red Cross, but that it is too early to talk about mediation in Ukraine talks, though Moscow is committed to a diplomatic solution through talks with the governments in Kyiv, and he dismissed Ukraine's proposal to stage talks in Mariupol, the besieged city that has been shelled heavily throughout the war in Ukraine. About the repeated reports of violations of international humanitarian and human rights law and possible war crimes, and they require independent investigation for effective accountability. The United Nations is ready to fully mobilize its human and logistical resources to help save lives in Mariupol. My proposal is for a coordinated work of the United Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the Ukraine and Russian Federation forces to enable the safe evacuation of those civilians who want to leave, both inside the Azovstal plan and in the city, in any direction they choose, and to deliver the humanitarian aid required. Four hours before his meeting with Mr. Guterres, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said in an interview with Russian state television that the Ukrainian conflict will end with an agreement, but its content uh, will depend on the military situation. He, however, warned the West not to underestimate the elevated risk of nuclear conflict over Ukraine, saying he viewed NATO as being, in essence, engaged in a proxy war with Russia by supplying key weaponry. When asked about the importance of avoiding World War III and whether the current situation is comparable to the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, he said he was doing a lot to uphold the principle of striving to prevent nuclear war at all costs. Lavrov also blamed Washington for the lack of dialogue, saying the United States has practically seized all contacts simply because we were obliged to defend Russians in Ukraine. Well, Ukraine has responded to Russia's claims Western allies could be provoking a wider conflict by supplying Ukraine with weapons, describing the comment as utter nonsense. Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba tweeted about this earlier today, saying Russia senses its defeat in Ukraine and is therefore trying to intimidate the West against supporting Kyiv by warning of the threat of World War III breaking out. He says this is the reason the world must double down on supporting Ukraine so that it can prevail and safeguard European and global security. Well, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, is expecting some 8.3 million people to flee Ukraine this year, revising up its previous projection. More than 12.7 million people have fled their homes and their parts to months, including 7.7 .7 million people displaced internally and more than 5 million who have fled over borders. This is coming from UNHCR spokesperson Shabir Manto. UNHCR had previously planned some 4 million refugees in the immediate aftermath of the invasion on February 24, but this was surpassed last month. Launching an updated regional refugee response plan for the Ukraine situation yesterday, UNHCR and partners are seeking 1.85 billion US dollars to support a projected 8.3 million refugees in neighboring countries, namely Hungary, the Republic of Moldova, Poland, Romania and Slovakia, as well as other countries in the region, including Belarus, Bulgaria and the Czech Republic. 1.7 million people in the past two months alone, of whom more than 5 million have fled as refugees across the borders, and 7.7 million remain displaced inside the country. 
Almost 13 million more people are also estimated to be stranded in affected areas or unable to leave due to security risks. Moldova has stepped up security measures after a series of explosions in the breakaway Russia-backed region of Transnistria. Moldovan president urged citizens to remain calm after explosions raised fears of a spillover from the conflict with Russia. Meantime, Germany's government has authorized the supply of about 50 anti-aircraft tanks to Ukraine. Well, here's more in this report. We begin outside Ukraine today with the Polish foreign minister who is visiting India and talking about how the world was taken by surprise with Russia's aggression against Ukraine. While speaking on the Poles who opened their homes and their hearts to their Ukrainian neighbors, he spoke of a new dilemma affecting a lasting European consensus. After 60 days of the war, we have a certain debates going on in public or also behind the closed doors when many European leaders, I must say, are facing the dilemma how to combine the protection of the most basic human values like human rights, life, uh, to, to live a uh, democracy and the preservation of international humanitarian law on one side and the economic well-being of their societies. During the panel at the Thank EU you, Meets the Balkans Forum in Sofia, the EU's much. enlargement commissioner said that if yeah, candidate right, countries right, were to spearhead social and economic uh, reforms, uh, as well as threaten the so rule of law and democratic principles on the ground, the EU could not ignore their progress. I cannot hide the fact that um, I'm extremely disappointed that we're still discussing this issue, uh, because we thought that we have sorted it out uh, two years ago, but now it's back on the table again. So, you know, if you have powers and you don't use it, it is also considered by others as a surrender of your powers and capabilities. So we need to trust ourselves, we need to trust uh, our powers, and I think all member states should trust the transformative nature of the accession process. Meanwhile, after Monday's missile attack by Russia aimed at disrupting weapons supplies to Ukraine's forces in the east, these firefighters tackled the blaze at a railway substation in the southwestern Ukrainian town of Krasny. In footage released by the Emergency Service of Ukraine, fire teams were seen using ladders and spraying foam to fight the blaze. In the meantime, Lithuania's president, Gitanas Nasida, visited a United States warship. The U.S. has gravely docked in, in the Baltic Sea port city of Klaupida. Speaking at a media briefing following the visit, Nasida said that keeping the Baltic Sea open was important to the region. Lithuanian Chief of Defense Valdemar Srupsi says to gathered media that the visit of the U.S. guided missile destroyer was a sign that the U.S. supports the security of Lithuania. The cradle will drop, the gun will fire, and like the old saying goes, send rounds down range. Among the countries expected to announce an increase in military support for Ukraine at the meeting of NATO and EU defense ministers today is Germany. According to reports, the German government is set to back sending mobile anti-aircraft guns to Ukraine. The Jeepa twin cannon system has been in service with the German army since the 1970s and is based on the chassis of the Leopard tank. As we all know, the rules-based international order continues to be under threat with Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. And we are here today to discuss what more we can do as countries and partners in support of Ukraine. Canada has trained 33,000 members of the Ukrainian army, including 2,000 members of the Ukrainian National Guard. 
Meanwhile, Russia says it is closely following events in Moldova's pro-Russian breakaway region of Transnistria as Moldova's president convened an urgent security meeting Tuesday. Transnistria has been subject to several attacks in the past day. Local authorities reported a military unit was targeted. Blasts tore through Transnistria's state security headquarters and two explosions damaged old Soviet-era radio antenna. Over in Zaraspolsia, southern Ukraine, the regional government have released videos of people shoring up the city's defenses, preparing for possible Russian attack. Video clips showed excavators digging up soil and workers in trenches. At least one person was killed and another wounded in a rocket strike on a commercial premises on Tuesday. Joining us for more now on the latest in Ukraine is uh, Mitchell Agatishe, foreign affairs expert and lawyer. Thanks for joining us on the program. I'd like to begin with UN Secretary General's visit to Moscow uh, and all that we've seen come out of that visit. Uh, what were your expectations and did they meet them? Thank you very much, Mr. Center, and it's always a pleasure to be here. My expectations when the UN Secretary General was going really was to go and, you know, try his very best to diffuse the situation, to try his very best to communicate, you know, the uproar of the world, particularly the United Nations, particularly because we have seen several instances where we have seen resolutions etc., from the United Nations. Now, to the extent that the current geopolitical situation is quite sensitive. There clearly has been, or there is a limit to what he can say. He has to speak sternly enough, such as to ensure that his message goes across, but also at the same time, he has to be at least amicable enough, such that channels of communication do not close. To my mind, I think he balanced that very well, and he was able to clearly articulate the stern consternation of the world while ensuring that um, at least channels of communication will remain open. So I think he did a good job, um, but the impact of this will be seen in the coming months when we see whether there in fact will be a de-escalation. And um, I also look forward to what he will say when um, he arrives in Ukraine in coming days, because um, this was the first part of a two-part trip. Um, spanning Ukraine and Russia. And finally, just to say that, of course, we can never really know the entirety of what was discussed. All we were built is what was discussed during the press conference. So, of course, if there have been other discussions held in secret, in camera rather, confidentially, um, whether that is effectively communicated to the Ukrainian side and whether that can then create a platform for should I say, resolution of this conflict, then we can celebrate. Let's talk about Moscow's position. And Lavrov um, made that uh, comment when he complained the Western involvement in Ukraine has been sort of used as a foothold uh, to limit, control, provoke, aggravate, if you will, Russia. And, you know, do you think that there is a, a real threat of World War III? Well, I think the first thing to say, and I would like to borrow that from Shakespeare, who said that all is fair in love and war. Um, for Russia to come arms in the air, basically stating that, you know, there shouldn't be any interference, I think is quite a rich statement to make. Why? Because, um, of course, you're pulverizing a country. Um, you would expect them to try and seek aid, military aid from elsewhere, and for that to indeed come through. If this precipitates or results in a third world war, particularly if it results in nuclear warfare, um, then to a large extent, I would say that it would have resulted from an overreaction from Russia. Remember that what Russia had said at the start of their justification was that they were doing this as a peace mission to protect the people of Eastern Ukraine. If this were to result in third world war, i.e. Russia possibly attacking a NATO country and the NATO country then triggering Article 5 that enables all of NATO to come into war, then clearly it would 
demonstrate that this was never about Eastern Ukraine, and this was about ensuring that there's no further expansion, right, of NATO to the doorstep of Russia, which we all believe it to be the case. Um, that being said, um, it is not our prayer for there to be a third world war. We already are suffering the impact economically of this war between Ukraine and Russia. And one can only imagine what it would be if it were to extend beyond that. I just want to add a final point though. Um, it also is a question of interpretation. The NATO countries have been quite careful not to put boots on the ground, but rather to arm Ukraine to defend themselves. However, I understand that a couple of days ago, um, it was Sergei Lavrov who said that as far as Russia is concerned, uh, the Western countries are part of this war because they are arming Ukraine. Thus, it appears that if they have taken that interpretation and the United States and the rest of NATO continues on the basis that they have, which is extra funding, I understand that after Blinken and um, you know, Austin visited Ukraine a couple of days ago, um, a further announcement was made about $800 million in arms. So if Russia continues to view this as an act of war, then, I mean, your guess is as good as mine, that we do not know what the um, reaction of Russia to NATO and the other countries funding Ukraine might be. And perhaps finally, in a minute or, or two, if you can, another thing that might also affect their reaction might also be um, what we're hearing from Finland and Sweden, uh, the announcing simultaneous bids, which it is reported that, that it will happen next month. Do you think this will aggravate, uh, you know, the situation between Russia and Ukraine? I think it will aggravate the situation between Russia and Ukraine. I also think that it may also lead to Russia expanding their um, should I say, military actions, um, potentially to cover those countries, because um, for many foreign policy analysts, they have been able to see beyond the smoke screen of protecting Donbass and Luhansk, and seeing that indeed Russia's end game is to prevent NATO expansion to their doorstep. Both, or rather Finland, has a very long border with Russia, and that could also be bringing NATO to the doorstep of Russia. So, of course, I think it would, be, it would um, aggravate um, the current conflict that we see. That being said, uh, what is currently on contemplation at the moment is an application to join NATO, right? It is for NATO to then accept that application. And um, I'm not sure that NATO will be willing right now to admit them both because if they were to do so, that's almost walking toward a solution, right? Almost working toward a particular end goal. Because, you know, we almost immediately know that the next reaction will then be for Russia to either attack or do something that um, may aggravate the whole situation. So for all parties to kind of keep things as they are, um, even if that application was made, what I see as a potential middle ground is a sort of defense pact where in NATO, as they have done with Ukraine, assures that, look, if you're under attack or anything of nature, we'll defend you. But, you know, admitting them to NATO at this time um, could be problematic. And just to finally touch on that point, you know, the context to this all was that, you know, after the fall of the Iron Curtain and the breakup of the USSR, um, in opposition to NATO was the Warsaw Pact. And I believe sometime in 2007, there was an international agreement between uh, Russia and the erstwhile Warsaw Pact countries and the United States that there was going to be a mutual de-escalation of expansion, for lack of a better phrase. So, um, you know, we also don't want a situation, or I'm not sure the world wants a situation where, um, you know, Finland and the other are admitted and it then gives, um, should I say, justification Right, right. So Russia saying, look, you're being in the face of, um, you know, this agreement and you're not um, adhering to it and all. So it would be a problematic situation, really, it will be.
All right, Michelle, a lot to talk about on this issue. Also seeing as Moldova uh, is saying they're stepping up security measures, seeing what has happened uh, in Transnistria. Uh, but thank you. We always yes. appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us on the program. No, it's always a pleasure to be with you, um, Millicent. I really do appreciate this. Thank you very much. And do have a great rest of the day. To you as well.